Now it is my pleasure to introduce our first distinguished speaker for today's symposium. Lieutenant General Robert Foley graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1963. He was a company commander during the Vietnam War, a battalion and brigade commander with the 3rd Infantry Division in Germany, assistant, sorry, assistant division commander, 2nd Infantry Division in Korea, West Point's Commandant of Cadets and Commanding General, 5th U.S. Army. His awards include the Medal of Honor, the Fairleigh Dickinson University Pin Pinnacle Award, and the United States Military Academy Distinguished Graduate Award, just a few of his many awards. I encourage you all to read Captain Foley's Medal of Honor citation in which his heroism and dedication to duty is described while leading his unit in an assault on a strong enemy position on November 5th, 1966. It is my great, great honor to welcome Lieutenant General Foley to the National Army Museum and the Vietnam War Symposium. <clears throat> During the summer of 1966, uh, General William C. Westmoreland, then the Commanding General of the U.S. Military Assistant Command in Vietnam, was very concerned about uh, reports he was receiving of increased Viet Cong activity in Tainan province. As some of you may remember, Tainan province is located about 90 kilometers northwest of uh, Saigon. In fact, it's at the end of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. If you start in Hanoi and go along the borders with uh, Laos and Cambodia, eventually spills into <coughs> various places in South Vietnam. To ensure the approaches to Saigon were well protected, General Westmoreland made the decision in the summer of 1966 to place the newly arriving 196 Light Infantry Brigade from Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Well, apparently, we have somebody from the 196 popped right up. Sorry. Were you there? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> well, you can verify everything I said. <laughs> and uh, place them near the uh, provincial capital of uh, Tainan City. Now, although Tedders intelligence was sparse about that particular area. Uh, we did know that Tainan province consisted of uh, heavily wooded, dense jungle terrain with triple canopy trees, um, visibility limited to 10 to 15 meters, and uh, artillery support, <coughs> artillery fire support in most cases uh, had to be done by sound instead of direct observation. What we did not know was enemy intent. The communist strategy for um, operating BC, Viet Cong, and NVA forces in South Vietnam was handled, was governed by the um, Central Office of South Vietnam, which we referred to as Kosman. And uh, Kosman was not a headquarters located at a fixed site. It consisted of Viet Cong and NVA leaders who lived in jungle huts and were constantly on the move to avoid detection. In July of 1966, uh, and we didn't know this, by the way, this is <coughs> we we're not, weren't privy to this. July 1966, the Kosman Commanding General went to Hanoi to visit with the North, North Vietnamese Minister of Defense. His purpose was to recommend to the Minister of Defense that a large-scale offensive be conducted against American forces. It hadn't been done before, but they wanted to do it, and they felt it was time. And <coughs> now, the Minister of Defense was uh, very comfortable with Viet uh, Cong hit and run tactics, and also very weary of American military firepower. So at first, he was reluctant to endorse such a large scale operation. But after talking with the, uh, with the uh, commanding general of Kosman, he ultimately approved the concept. The mission was given to the um, 9th Viet Cong Division, which consisted of the 271st and 272nd regiments augmented for this operation by the 101st North Vietnamese Army Regiment. Their objective was destruction of the 196 Light Infantry Brigade. Again, we didn't know any of this. The 196 LIV was commanded by Brigadier General Edward H. Desasor. Uh, he's a field artillery officer whose experience was with, primarily with guided missile units, and this was his first infantry command. Uh, his top priority was to build the brigade base camp, conduct operations to familiarize themselves with the surrounding terrain, and to gain intelligence on enemy activity in the area. In mid-October, the 196 uh, commenced Operation Attleboro, which consisted of a series of um, 
company-sized search and destroy operations. <clears throat> While one battalion remained at the base camp, the other two battalions of the 196 deployed out to uh, an abandoned Michelin rubber plantation, which was located near Dao Chang, 25 kilometers east of uh, Tainan City. After just two weeks of operations, the 196 received reports that uh, the 9th Viet Cong D Division was moving in their direction. General Dessasseur immediately uh, contacted two field force to request reinforcements. Two field force tasked the 25th Infantry Division at Kuchi to provide the requisite support. On 1 November 1966, the 1st Battalion, 27th Infantry, which came under the 2nd Brigade of the 25th Infantry Division, was placed under the operational control of the 196 LIV. At 7 p.m. on 2 November, the battalion commander, Major Guy Malloy, attended a briefing at the 196 Tactical Operations Center, which was along an airstrip there in the uh, Michelin rubber plantation. And the briefing was given by the Brigade S3 and lasted less than five minutes. The operation called for Bravo and Charlie companies of the 1st to 27th to conduct air mobile, and this was the next day, to conduct air mobile assaults on opposite sides of the brigade area of operations, 5,000 meters apart, the landing zones. In addition, Alpha Company 127 was placed in brigade reserve. So Malloy basically had no internal assets to go to the help of Bravo or Charlie in case either one of them got into trouble. Uh, in addition, four companies from two other battalions, the other two battalions that were out there, the 196, were uh, going to be uh, deployed on independent company size search and destroy operations in between Bravo and Charlie Company. So essentially what you had in the south end of the Brigade Area of Operations were six company size search and destroy missions heading north throughout the Brigade Area Operation, all independent. Um, the, other, the other issue was that there were only two sets of control measures. You know, one of the things you need in dense, heavily wooded terrain is you need a lot of control measures. The only control measures available were, were three link-up points on the north end of the uh, Brigade Area of Operations and the axis of events for the six rifle companies. That was it. There was no mission statement, no commander's intent, no concept of the operation, no estimate of the enemy situation. After Major Malloy vehemently objected to the plan and explained his rationale to General Dessessor, General Dessessor stood up and said the plan would stand as is and walked out of the briefing tent. On the morning of 3 November, Charlie Company 127 conducted an uh, air mobile assault according to plan in the northwest corner of the Brigade Area of Operations. They landed at an LZ in four foot high elephant grass and were immediately hit by enemy uh, rocket propelled grenades, heavy machine guns, uh, snipers and trees. Within 20 minutes, the company commander and first sergeant were KIA. Two platoon leaders and two platoon sergeants were severely wounded. A helicopter that had come in to uh, evacuate uh, medical casualties was hit with an RPG, crashed on the ground, and one um, crew member was killed. Major Malloy immediately took control of the battle and was provided reinforcements consisting of Alpha Company 127, which had been put in Brigade Reserve, as well as Charlie Company 3rd of the 21st. When Malloy got on the ground and got those two companies, he maneuvered against the enemy positions and um, the uh, Viet Cong withdrew but not before Charlie Company had five KIA and 13 wounded. At 0700 the next morning, uh, a young captain from the gate headquarters flew out to the uh, field site where uh, 1st to 27th <coughs> had their headquarters, and uh, he wanted to show Major Malloy a map with a large goose egg on it that was their objective for the day. Uh, Major Malloy proceeded to ask the young captain a series of questions which the captain could not answer. So Major Moy basically acknowledged receipt of the plan and the captain flew back to brigade headquarters. At 11 a.m., Task Force 127 advanced to the northeast 
with uh, Alpha Company 127 leading, then Charlie third the 21st, then uh, Charlie Company uh, first the 27th. Around noon, they ran into intense enemy weapons fire, mortar fire, and snipers and trees, similar to what they had the other day, except mortar fire was added this time. Major Malloy placed his three companies in a perimeter defense. And over the next several hours, he called in close air support, gunships, artillery support, and was able to hold off the enemy assaults that were coming against the defensive perimeter. During one of the mortar attacks, <clears throat> Major Malloy was wounded in the elbow, the knee, and the shoulder. In mid-afternoon, uh, Colonel William Barrett, the commanding officer of 2nd Battalion, 27th Infantry, which is, goes back to 2nd Brigade of the 25th uh, Division, um, my battalion commander, called uh, Major Malloy on the radio, and he said, I am airborne with Charlie Company 227, and I've been instructed by Atlas 6, which is General Desasoro, to come to your location and relieve you so that you can be medically evacuated. Major Malloy was stunned. He hadn't asked for reinforcements, and he didn't feel like any of his wounds were serious. But he gave Colonel Barrett the grid coordinates for a landing zone, and, uh, it, and it happened to be the, land, the same landing zone that Alpha 127 had landed in the day before, so he's very familiar with the area. And he told him to move due east from the LZ to an open area, and then move due north and could come right in behind 127 defensive perimeter. At about 6 p.m., Colonel Barrett called Major Malloy on the radio and said, I'm with Charlie Company. There are Viet Cong between you and me. I'm going to retrace my route and try to go around the VC elements. Apparently, instead of, after Colonel Barrett landed with Charlie Company at the LZ, instead of going due east first and then due north, he went due north first with Charlie Company and then due east which placed him right behind an elaborate enemy bunker system. At 7 p.m., PFC William Wallace, Colonel Barrett's radio telephone operator, called Major Malloy on the radio and told him that um, Colonel Barrett and Captain Jerry Currier, the company commander of Charlie Company, were both KIA, and uh, that he knew there were several other soldiers in uh, Charlie Company 227 that were KIA, and he, and he knew there were many, many more wounded. And the survivors were hunkering down in an old B-52 bomb crater. Now it was getting dark, and uh, what Major Malloy told PFC Wallace is to get the word out, I want you to lay low, no noise, and, and uh, no firing of weapons unless the VC attack you directly. Now, before Charlie Company had got caught behind enemy lines, behind the bunker system, Major Malloy knew exactly what he wanted to do. That evening, he was going to exfiltrate, pull back from the uh, enemy positions he was in contact with, and he was going to, the next morning, call in gunships, called Sear Support, artillery, and totally decimate the uh, Viet Cong and NBA positions. Unfortunately, this was a turning point in the operation. He knew now that option did no, no longer existed. That if he was in any way going to have a chance of uh, rescuing Charlie Company 227 from behind enemy lines, he was going to have to maintain contact with the enemy right where he was. My company, Alpha Company, 2nd Battalion, 27th Infantry, was airlifted into 127 perimeter at about 8 p.m. on the 4th of November. At 1 a.m. on 5 November, I reported to uh, Major Malloy uh, to receive an operations order. The first thing he told me was, I am convinced that if we don't take immediate action at first light, Charlie Company will be annihilated in the morning. He said, here's what I want you to do. He told me, he said, you've got to take your company through the 1st and 27th defensive perimeter, bust through the enemy uh, bunker system, link up with Charlie Company, and then form a corridor back through the enemy bunker system to the friendly front lines 
evacuating all of Charlie Company's dead and wounded. I see a couple of you shaking their heads. That's basically what I did. I sat there thinking, this is a suicide mission. But if we didn't go, who would? Everybody else was committed. One other piece of unwelcome news. I was told that because of the proximity of Charlie Company to the enemy bunker system, I could not use close air support, artillery, or um, gunships. I was going to have to do something we, the company, we're going to have to do something we'd never done before. We're going to have to fight with what we carried in with us. With only a few hours to daylight, I briefed my platoon leaders on only that part of the mission that got us through the enemy bunker system. Because I felt if we were lucky enough to link up with Charlie Company, I wasn't about to come back through enemy lines carrying Charlie Company's dead and wounded. I'd already done a map recon to the Northwest, and I knew there were a couple of LZs. And if we linked up with Charlie Company, I was going to carry them directly to the Northwest to a remote site out of the battle area, and then uh, call in for uh, medical evacuation. Um, at 7.30 a.m., we departed the friendly front lines in a column of platoons. Had first platoon leading with uh, Lieutenant Harold K. Graves, who was my seasoned platoon leader, and I know he'd, uh, he uh, knew precisely what to do if we got hit. And it was followed by the command group, uh, third platoon, and then second platoon. We, we got to about 30 meters uh, after passing through um, first to seventh perimeter defense, and the enemy hit us with automatic weapons fire, with rocket propelled grenades, and with snipers and trees. Now, my biggest fear in assaulting enemy position, not just this one, but any other one, was maintaining momentum. I know you're familiar with that. But I did not want to get pinned down, ever, on any operation at any time. Um, however, this was becoming more of a reality because I kept hearing cries from medics. In addition, we discovered that the enemy had cut uh, tunnels of fire from their bunker system through the dense vegetation, but it was waist high. So you couldn't see it unless we got down in a crouch position or in a crawling position and looked down and then you could see this tunnel went right back to a machine gun that was, uh, um, that, was uh, that had a Viet Cong or NBA soldier at the end of it. Uh, I knew at that moment in time, um, that uh, we were in a bad situation. But we never did lose momentum. It was really slow. We had to move very cautiously, but I did get first, with first platoon, I moved up uh, third platoon online, and we continued to move, inch, inching forward. And at one point, I got third, uh, I committed uh, um, second platoon. So we got uh, all three platoons moving through the uh, the dense foliage. Uh, and then <clears throat> when we reached the enemy bunker and trench system, we launched an assault. Firing M16s, light anti-tank weapons, machine guns, uh, grenade launchers, throwing hand grenades at this uh, enemy uh, bunker and trench system, and uh, the enemy withdrew. Now I knew at that moment in time because of all the other indicators that I would had uh, during that period of time, that we didn't have the firepower or the manpower to continue. We'd been in the battle for three and a half hours. Um, we'd taken heavy casualties. We were low on ammunition. While I was contemplating what to do next, uh, I received a call from Major Wes Lockhart, who was the Battalion S3 and now the Acting Battalion Commander. He called me on the radio and directed that we withdraw. He told me that due to our assault, the NBA and the VC had uncovered Charlie Company in order to face us. And at the same time, uh, Captain Bob Garrett, who was Bravo Company 127 uh, Company Commander, had gone up to the north with uh, other companies from the 196 and had no um, opposition. Uh, pretty much on his own initiative, decided with uh, 
with the, the a NBA and the VC totally consumed with fighting against us, that they would come down uh, from the north, sweep in from the north and link up with uh, Charlie Company 227, which they did unopposed. And they did exactly what I was going to do. They turned and went to the northwest and went to those LZs and took out all of the dead and wounded from Charlie Company. Now, Charlie Company was in worse shape than we thought. They had 15 KIA and 70 wounded. It's a good thing I didn't link up with them because I wouldn't have been able to handle it. It took the best efforts of three rifle companies to get all the dead and wounded out of there and up into the uh, northwest so they could be evacuated. After giving instructions to withdraw, uh, I sensed there was an eerie silence on the battlefield. We've gone from explosions and continuous firing to all of a sudden an absence of sounds. Now, the NBA and the VC had gone to great steps to prepare very elaborate bunker systems. Bunkers made of concrete with overhead cover in the middle of the jungle. So my question on 5 November was, where did they go and why? And I didn't find out until years later. Uh, using captured enemy documents, Colonel Rod Pascal, who's a noted military historian, and also Bravo Company 227's company commander during Operation Attleboro, um, explained what happened. He wrote an extensive explanation in an article that he wrote. He said the 3rd Battalion of the 101st NBA Regiment that was facing the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the 27th Infantry uh, was so ravaged <coughs> by the American attacks <coughs> and the firepower that they actually fled the battlefield. And it took six days for the North Vietnamese to locate the survivors. On 6 November, the 127 and 227 Infantry were um, pulled out of the operation and flown back to the 25th Infantry Division base camp at Kuchi. Uh, at the same time, the 1st Infantry Division, commanded by Major General William Depew, took over Operation Alvaro, and General, uh, General Desassour was relieved of command. Now, I would like to, at this point, uh, respond to any questions you might have about the presentation I just gave. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to ask you a question. And, and let's just go back to um, the operations order that um, Major Malloy received uh, at 7 p.m. on 2 November. Uh, if you remember, uh, he wasn't all happy about that operation plan and he vigorously and vehemently objected to the plan, after which uh, General uh, Desassour stood up uh, said the plan stands as is, and walked out of the briefing tent. So my question is, were there any other options available to Major Malloy at that point in time? From the time that uh, uh, General Desassour walked out of the tent, leaving behind the three battalion commanders, Major Malloy, the other two battalions, the brigade staff, all the way up until when they deployed the next day. Was there anything else that Malloy could have done or should have done at that moment in time? What do you think? Yes, sir. I knew Guy Malloy at uh, Fort Benning. Uh, one of the things he could have done is uh, called his own chain of command and just shared with him what he was told and let higher powers uh, school Desser. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's very good. That's uh, Colonel Tom Tarpley was a second brigade commander. And um, I think you're absolutely right. I think that's a, if you're uncomfortable with it, you remember you're under, uh, you're under operational control, call your parent brigade commander, say, hey, look, I don't, I don't, I'm not particularly comfortable with this. Matter of fact, if I were the parent brigade commander and that battalion didn't, command, bag, battalion commander didn't call me, I'd really be upset at him for not telling me. We, you know, I'm in a bad situation here, boss. And so what do you think then that uh, Colonel Tom Topley would have done when he found that out? I knew him too. What? I knew him too. Oh, you did? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're very well informed. This is good. <laughs> no, but what do you think he would have done at that point had, had that taken place? Oh, 
I think he would have uh, uh, ratted out General Desasor's uh, poor leadership to. Uh, would he, would, do you think he would have called Desasor? Either that or whoever Desasor reported to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there were a number of things he could have done. He could have gone to, um, to um, the chief of staff of the division, uh, could have gone to <clears throat> Desasor, could have flown up and sat down with Desasor, you know, could have figured something else. One of the things that, as, as I looked at all this, is that this Operation Attleboro was General Desasor's own operation. He didn't have to do it the next morning. He could have waited two days. He, he could have done it, waited two weeks. He could have canceled it. It was his to do whatever he wanted. So there was nothing magical, you know, about <clears throat> doing it the next morning um, uh, for any reasons. And he was sitting there with three infantry battalion commanders. He's an artillery commander. You know, I, <laughs> the first thing that struck me was, hey, guys, what do you think? Somebody else have a thought back there? Go ahead. Uh, this is, I think, on that point, but I'm wondering your, your thoughts, because Desasar was appointed the commander because he had the appropriate rank. You know, West Merlin thought if you're going to be a brigade commander, because the colonel who had actually trained with 196 was didn't have the BG rank, if, if that's... Do, do you know what, what no. I'm talking? Okay, well, and maybe you can... It, Enlighten me, but apparently the person who trained the 196 was still only a colonel, and in West Marlin preferred a one star to be in command. So that's why Desasor was chosen. And I guess what I'm getting at is, do you have any insight in who actually made that decision? Because it, I've had this discussion with some folks who are really in Attleboro, and they feel like, well, how did this guy? I mean, this air defense expert basically get chosen for such a you yeah. know de demanding assignment so i guess i'm sort of going back to the beginning do you have any insight in why yeah. or who chose you know tap desasar yeah well you know to preclude a lot of this from happening that's always a question you know who, who screened through the individual who got selected to be in command and i don't know since he was a general officer i have i have to think that if uh, westmoreland wasn't involved in knowing that this general officer is now going to come in, I would think he would be involved in it, but I, I really don't know. I have no idea. Yeah. So uh, go ahead, sir. One of the things I've always, one of the things I've always found is if I'm giving guidance that I think is incomplete or it's really, really screwed up, I'm not going to challenge the guy head on in that, but I'm going to work out a plan on my own. Uh, based on He's, what my experience has been my and, and to have that in my pocket uh the point that you made that the general was an artillery officer and you had that tremendous uh amount of knowledge in those infantry battalion commanders that needed to be tapped um even informally in order to be able to uh go forward and these guys had these guys have been around. I know. I know. After I had been there for seven or eight months, I, I thought I really knew what was going on, and that needed to be tapped. A secondary plan needed to have been worked out. Coordination between the commanders. I'm, I'm listening to six independent companies without mutual support. Um, going forward, I, I, I just think that it's a setup for, for a real problem. But the initiative needed to have been taken internally in order to pretend, to have something to address what they believe to have been a real problem. Yeah, okay. All right, anybody else want to comment? Go ahead. Yes, um, I'm not military at all, so real novice of looking at this, but I, I don't know whether it's a career ending move, but if these are experienced battalion commanders after he left following up in his idea, would it have been a, appropriate for the three of them to get together and say, this is really stupid. Um, we, we need to go to somebody as a group. Um, if you get my drift, could the three battalion commanders all have un unified together and then uh, tried to approach the general again or yeah. gone a route? 
Yeah, I, I would think that, from my standpoint, I would think that would be option one. Great commanders walked out of the briefing tent. Um, Lloyd just finished explaining all his rationale. He just turned to the other battalion commanders, the brigade staff, and brigade S3, and brigade XO. He said, hey guys, what do you think? Am I wrong? Is there something I'm missing here? If not, why don't we just take a couple of hours here and sit back and come up with an alternate plan and then go brief Desasor and say, look, boss, we understand what you want to get done. We understand your intent, but why don't we do it this way? And let's not start tomorrow morning. Let's give it a day so we can, you know, get or two days or whatever they want. Now you've got three infantry battalion commanders going to them with infantry advice saying, you need to do the following things. You need a lot more control measures. You need to make sure all the five paragraph field orders completely filled out. I agree. I think that might have been step one. And uh, if that didn't work, I think what was brought up before about going to the parent brigade commander. Okay. Let's just assume, that, go ahead, sir. <laughs> so I have a question for you. I mean, I did two years in green, so I'm not very experienced with the military, but you are or have been. <clears throat> and uh, so my question is, what do you think about the Army now? Has that aspect that we're discussing improved? Or do you think the leadership quality is the same? Well, yeah, but I just, in just a few words, I think that's the, um, the beauty of having a symposium like this. Because the leadership problems are the same in any war, any any kind of tactical, strategic issue. The same kinds of problems come up, and that's why I think it's great that we get to discuss these things. Because I, I know sometimes I go out and talk to soldiers. You know, I was the honorary colonel of the 27th Infantry in in uh, Hawaii, and uh, and I sit there and look at them, and I said, God, these guys are really young, and I realize they weren't born during the Vietnam War. Their fathers weren't born during the Vietnam War. And sometimes their grandfathers weren't alive during the Vietnam War. So how do I identify with these guys? But it's all about leadership. And so I think it's a very good point. Some of the leadership issues that we're talking about here, they don't change that much. Uh, I wanna, there's one other one I want to talk about towards the end. But let's, let's see if we can't go. You, had, you wanted to make a point. More of a statement. And uh, there's a statement and a question. I know from my experiences as a young lieutenant platoon leader, company exec, having a, 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 a company commander, a battalion commander, a brigade commander that you have trust in, because the two points are, yeah, we have a mission to accomplish, but I'm, what about the welfare of my men? If I can't assure that they have a reasonable chance of surviving this mission, then the mission has to be questioned what outcome do we expect? Now, you as a young company commander at that time, um, when you heard the orders coming down from the battalion commander, did the company commanders look at each other going, you know, what's going on here? Do we have a reasonable chance of surviving this? And how do I put my men into this meat grinder and yeah. expect them to come out? Yeah. Mission and welfare. Well, it's interesting you ask that question because I think you're absolutely right. Those company commanders do. The country commanders, battalion commanders, brigade commanders, you got to think, hey, is this very risky for, for our soldiers? And if so, why are we pushing it? Like I just said, you don't, you don't have to do it tomorrow morning. Let's step back and see you know, what's a better, better option. So, no, I agree with that 100%. And, um, I, and I'm going to get you. I, I know you got your hand up, but I just want uh, that day, on the 4th of November, before I went into the brigade, um, uh, before I went in to get the briefing for the operation on the 5th of November, that day, uh, I was called by the um, General Desasor, and uh, he, he wanted me to get one of my platoons to go out and secure a downed helicopter. And I'd been out in the Hobo and Boile Woods, and it, there was some, you have to, there's some tough, tough hombres out there. I mean, they get you. And so I, I told um, General Desasor, I said, sir, uh, I, I'm not giving you a platoon. I'll take the whole company, but I'm not going to give you a platoon. He said, we don't have enough helicopters and walked off. Just the walk off is a, it was just normal modus operandi to walk off. And um, 
he walked off and the Brigade XO was there. And I told the Brigade XO, I said, hey, he can do what he wants. I'm not doing it. I'll take the whole company, but I am not giving him a platoon. He said, wait right here. He ran up and he talked to um, General Desasaur and General Desasaur said, okay. So I got the whole company and guess what? When I went out to get the down helicopter, the VC were waiting because they like to do that. They like to get another force in there and take advantage of and surprise them. Unfortunately, we had a force where I could leave one platoon with a helicopter, two platoons maneuvering, artillery fire support, and uh, and they withdrew. So you're absolutely right. I mean, that does it. Uh, go ahead in the back. I want to make sure. I... Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Great presentation um, and a great leadership lesson. Um, two questions. One is with respect to General Justice Sir and his selection for, and sort of already been brought up, but selection for that brigade and brigade command, it seems to be have to have been out of his element, and which to me is a systemic, was a systemic issue in the Army. And did the Army fix that after that um, in terms of selecting a, an air defense officer to command an infantry brigade? The second is the decision to relieve him. Um, who made that decision, I guess, and how common was that in Vietnam? Um, based on your experience or the yeah. Army in Vietnam? Okay, uh, yeah, and the first question, I agree with you. <clears throat> you know, there wasn't even anything more important when I was the commander, battalion, brigade, uh, at the division level, fifth army. I looked at a chart every day about who's gonna go where. And I wanted to make sure I put the right person in the right place. And if it's a battalion commander, I had company commanders, platoon leaders, platoon sergeants, I wanna make sure who they were. So that. I think all commanders have to be intensively managing that process to make sure they get the right person. And if they don't get the right person in there, it's time to pull them up. You know, so go, go ahead, sir. I was with the 199th Light Infantry. We came in December of 67. Just General Westmoreland took the colonel that trained the, the, uh, the brigade, replaced them with an active infantry ADC from the 9th Division, and that general um, actually worked uh, well, and one of the things that general did was give us the lessons from General Desasor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Well, I want to get back to the second part of your question, though, and that was why did General Desasor get, get relieved? Well, he got relieved because uh, uh, General, um, um, the, the acting CG of the 25th Division, no, actually, it would have been the T two field force commander at that time, which was General Wyan. He called General Depew and said, you get over there to Operation Ball. I'm hearing bad reports. You, you got to get over there and check it out. So he did. He went over there. And the first thing he did was go look for. While I was being engaged with the, with, uh, uh, with the um, NVA and VC in those positions, trying to get through to Charlie Company, during that time, that morning, General Desasaur decided it was time to go back to uh, the Tainian base camp to take a shower. That's where General Depew found him. And that's when he told him, don't bother coming back, you're relieved. So that's how he got relieved. Anyway, yes. Sir, it's good to hear your presentation today. Uh, my name is Kevin Lewis. First, I want to say to you that um, I was a cadet at the academy when you showed up as a tech officer. And uh oh, now we're you're, in trouble. Well, you're a tall man. You're a tall man, but I want you to know that when we when we saw you coming anywhere, you were seven feet tall minimum when we saw you coming. Okay, I just want you to know that. Okay, uh, some of my classmates talk about this right now when I mention mention you speaking here today. Uh, second thing is I want to thank all the veterans here who are actually downrange. I was a platoon leader in the Second Infantry Division from seventy five to seventy six. And so, right, as we were pulling out of Vietnam, and I served with some um, wonderful NCOs who were had been downrange twice or more, and some of you were downrange. I did not go downrange, but I want to say thank you to you for just your leadership and your service, what you did. I appreciate that. Um, question I have for you, sir, is I was recently at the Academy talking to the class of 2020, not talking with, but spending some time with members of the class of 2024. There's this affiliation going on, a 50 year affiliation. Can't believe I'm saying 50 years, but um, what would you want today's army, the leadership in the army as they're developing young leaders? I remember when I was a second lieutenant going into this infantry unit, 
Um, I felt prepared, but I also felt like, you know, there's, there's always questions about, am I doing the right thing? You know, you know, and you're just, you're trying to figure out all the things you need to do as a young leader. So, and, and that company grade, what would you, what do you think soldiers or um, the people who are developing leaders in the army today, what do they need to keep in mind? Because, you know, I look at those young faces now and I'm saying they're going to go out there, they're going to be facing some things that have no ideas coming at them. And I just want to be sure that the Army is developing them right. But any thoughts you would have on what you feel the Army needs to do to develop yeah. that young that, leadership that, rate? That's a very good question. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I was current with the core curriculum at the academy at one time, but they changed it. But I can tell you overall, having gone back up there and listened to you know, <clears throat> some of the folks, that um, I thought all too much time at West Point, and maybe in ROTC too, was spent on throwing hand grenades and rappelling and, and uh, going through uh, hang, um, bayonet assault courses. They're going to get that in the Army. You know, I think they really need to spend a lot more time on this business of moral ethical reasoning. You know, reasoning on our way to make decisions. And the more they get of that at the lower levels, the more easy and more comfortable are they're going to make those tough decisions that they have to make. And I, that's what I think have found is that leaders aren't tough enough to uh, enforce their own policies and programs sometimes because they don't feel comfortable. They haven't been able, they haven't gone through the, the um, um, uh, values-based decision-making process that gets them to where they need to be. And I think the sooner you ingrain that and instill that in young cadets and in young officers, the best you can, you know, that's, that's the way can, best way you can do it. I remember I was talking to my son, who's now out of Leavenworth, and I guess he was a brigade commander at the time. And I was talking to him about um, a, ch a change we were trying to make in in basic training uh, to get information on, on um, um, soldiers being better able to um, figure out their finances, especially when it comes to buying cars. You don't want to go out, oh, buy a new truck, and, buy a new, and then they have to take loans from Army Emergency Relief and that kind of thing. And so uh, we had some uh, classes that we thought would be best to put in there. We said, well, we, we have to run the hand grenade assault course and we have to fire the weapons and everything. My son said, dad, we'll take care of that part, but we can't teach them how to take care of their finances. If you can teach them to take care of their finances, then we'll be fine. We won't have everybody in debt all the time. So, you know, I, that, that's my view on that. I think sometimes you need to take a look at what needs to be done at the lower levels before it goes, uh, goes a higher level. Can we, can we just though, I, I never did follow this trace of um, what can Major Malloy do. Let us assume that um, he put this package together and they went to see Desasur and he said, no, we're gonna plan stands it is. And they went Tom Tarpley in second brigade, Tom Tarpley talked to um, Desasur and Desasur says, no, that's the way we're gonna do. Can, um, Major Malloy said, I'm not going to do it. Should he? Can he? Um, and this is not a reason, but because he complied with it, partially, not partially him, but, you know, there were 38 KIA and 127 wounded in those two days. No, it's not to say that they did something else that wouldn't have a lot of other ones. And that's no, that, that we didn't know that at the time, but if, if the operation wasn't a good operation, according to Malloy, should he just said, no, I'm not going to participate. No, nobody. <laughs> Could he do that? At one time. He could do it. I mean, he physically, he can say no, but there's always a consequence. Is he willing to take the consequence that will come with his decision? Yeah. But in the process, he puts his, could put his career in jeopardy, but he puts the welfare of his men first by, I'm not putting my men into this meat grinder, yeah. but I don't think 
the outcome is going to be at all positive. What would be the immediate consequence? He would be relieved of command. By who? The brigade commander. Topley, right? Hmm? Yeah, because in fact, I remember all the legal implications. The uh, the uh, commander that he's under the operation control can't do it because that's a command issue. You have to go up. So go. Topley would have to do it. Now, would Topley want to do it if he if he felt the guy was right? He could do it. Yeah. He could say, "I stand with the battalion commander. Right. I understand what he's right. I see the I see the bigger picture that this is going to cost us a lot of lives." But, it, but really, no positive. Outcome. But if somebody says, "I'm not going to do it," doesn't that also alert everybody else to say, "Maybe we better think about this." If we've got a seasoned battalion commander that says this mm -hmm. isn't right for the following reasons, and I'm really worried about uh, a, a risk to my soldiers, maybe we better look at it another way. So my, I guess my question is: Isn't it a good thing to just say, "No, I'm not going to do it." If he's a man of who has a, a respected reputation, he has a good track record. Other men, other other uh, lieutenant colonels, majors, and such, we're going to say, "Well, wait a second, what's going on here?" And then his lower grade officers, the captains and the lieutenants, will come to his defense. Also, yeah, it, it's a complicated situation. Yeah, when you stand, what would the what would the soldiers say if you said, "Well, I've got." If I do that, I'll take care of you, but you know it'll hurt my career. I said, wait a minute, you don't want you don't want to put us into a dangerous situation because it'll hurt your career. <laughs> I mean, so what should be motivating? Go ahead. I suppose there's also you might take being in his shoes might take into account of you know who's up the chain of command. Right. So weigh in 25th ID commander, smart cookie. Now, if if Malloy's like had some sense of how Wayand operated, how he thought, um, maybe he might have been more likely to press the issue, feeling like, OK, if I not fall on my sword, but protest, let's say, um, second guess that you know, when it goes up the chain that I might hear some, uh, get some receptive, you know, uh, ears higher up, you know, whoever's above to start, because otherwise you'd have to go up to seamen, right? The two field force commander. Um, but, you know, it's like, you have to think too, do I have top cover? You know, what, what are, what do I know about these commanders above? And I suppose to some extent that might play into your thinking. Um, Cause you know, if, if, Tarpley, it becomes a, you know, a, a spitting match between brigade commanders. Okay, well, who's above that? Who might adjudicate? Um, personally, I think Wayne might have been receptive. He's, like I said, he, I have a lot of admiration for him. Of course, he ended up four stars. He last Mac the commander, but that may be another consideration too. Yeah. But is is there some goodness though by just saying no? I'm I'm not going to do it, and then. And then watch that awareness take off. And, uh, you know, I mean, if, if, if that occurred to me and I heard about it, I said, why? What do you mean? What do you, I'd go find out and I'd try to figure it out. And, and, and if I found out that a lot of things were missing in the operation, I'd say, okay, guys, get back together and get this thing going on. It's a lot of different options that could result there. But the first one has to be, no, nope, not going to do it. You can do it, right? And understanding the consequences, it may be consequences. Also, the consequences might be, thank God you said what you did, because it got everybody to thinking about it, and your soldiers didn't have to suffer as much, you know, uh, uh, 38 killed and 127 wounded uh, as a result of, of the operation. Now, part of that was getting Charlie Company, you know, behind enemy lines. You know? um, anyway, someone else had a... Yeah. Go ahead. During that period of the war, 65 and 66, it was just an incredible can-do atmosphere. And uh, General S. Moreland was really pushing very, very hard on these uh, battalion uh, type of um, search and destroy operations, really to the exclusion to a lot of other things. The way that I catch the atmosphere from MACV at that time is 
this major would have just been cut, goodbye, I'll find somebody else who will do it. And that would be the end of it. And yeah. that's sadly, that was the, that was the dilemma that uh, General I believe, Johnston was the chief of staff of the army at the time that he stayed on with President Johnson. Uh, that he was trying to bring in some uh, sanity. And I think that's what the major was trying to do was, was he understood that this was not good, that it was not complete, but that this atmosphere out of MACV coming on down, pushing on down, the guy would have just been gone and uh, that would have been it. And you would have had some lackey put in there there are those people, they're a, rare minor, they're a minority, but uh, you just put in there and do what I say, and that would have been it. Okay. Yes, sir. I think that touches on another part of the potential calculation. It, he might have considered that it's a greater risk because if he's removed, then he cannot bring his expertise and his understanding of his unit maybe there would have been more casualties. If he had said no, somebody else would have said yes. And then that person would have been less capable to, because as you described, he was capable in the field. Right. And so he, the actions that he took actually protected his men perhaps better than if he had said no. Yeah, that's a good point. If in fact they, they said, well, we're gonna go ahead and kick it off anyway. But you, you're assuming then that there was no other awareness that that came up the chain of command because he said, I'm not doing it, it's too risky an operation. I kind of think that um, the, the, the leaders in the 25th Division and maybe go all the way up to Field Force um, if they heard about it. The other thing is, I think Desisor at some point would have said, okay, you guys feel that strongly about it. Maybe it's time to redo it. Uh, and, and I guess what I'm doing is I think there is some goodness and uh, just telling your superiors, boss, this is no good. I can't do it. I can't take the responsibility for taking my troops out there and doing this. It just does, it's not gonna work, I'm sorry. I think there's goodness in that. Go ahead, sir. Sir, uh, I'm a Marine from i -Corps, but uh, I'm not familiar with this operation, but what was the S3 during all this? I mean, he's the guy, he's a key guy in a, brigade type operation i would think yeah. did he, he just he, did he get relieved too and no he was well i don't know if he got relieved at the end he was the one who gave the five minute briefing and had the charts up there that's uh i mean i'm i'm sure he was there involved in all that but he's the guy that, he's the guy they should have really and or the chief there was a chief of staff too i assume now where were they brigade well the brigade had an executive officer in a, in a uh, brigade s3 someone else in the back had it go ahead now, I was not combat related. I was in combat support, so I can't talk, you know, field activities. But it seems to me you had three battalion commanders sitting in that room. Now, based upon what you said earlier, that um, there was the pew being sent in immediately because there was already issues. Somebody had already sent forward that information. Why didn't they stand together, is my question, and say, hey, we need to rethink this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what um, <clears throat> that's why at that point in time with everybody sitting there and the gay commander walked out of the uh, briefing tent, I think it would have been a great opportunity to just discuss it and get some uh, census of what's the right thing to do, put it all together, tell the brigade XO, he said, go, go tell um, General Justice, so we're going to come and see him. We revised the plan. We think we've got a much better plan. You got three infantry, uh, seasoned infantry battalion commanders who have been in Vietnam and gone through operations. They think they know what they're talking about. They need to come see you. I think Desisor would have said, God, okay, I agree. And uh, it would have been all right. But I, my, my point is uh, all these options we looked at were, would have been a lot better than going off and doing what, what occurred because of it was a disaster the entire way. Uh, you know, uh, in addition to my company and then Charlie Company and then Charlie Company first the 27th that landed in the four foot of high elephant grass. It was another company that made a night attack before uh, my my session and uh, they got pretty well wiped out. And that was all 
a part of the, um, <clears throat> the 38 KIA and 127 wounded. Well, let me just ask this one question. Is it, is it okay to say no when you're a commander? How many say it's not okay to say no? That you, that you should take orders and move out? You, you got another point. Go ahead. It's okay. <laughs> um, I also think, uh, maybe this is a stretch, uh, it showed lack of leadership with him saying no and walking out because there's more to it than that. It's like an attitude. Um, I mean, I, I, I think I get it. I think I understand what you did a great job of explaining this, by the way. I love this. But uh, I also think uh, as a leader, uh, he owes them more than to look like an attitude and just saying, I'm not going to do it. I understand he was worried about right. troops dying and all that. But there's something about the abrupt, no, I'm not doing it, and walking out that leaves everybody saying, what the hell was that all about? Right. I think. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> you think maybe it lowers <clears throat> the trust and confidence you have in that commander. <clears throat> and I agree. Well, one of the things I always did at every operations order, every meeting or anything else I had, I always said to the troops before they left, I said, okay, you guys, I don't want anybody walking out that door saying Foley's all screwed up. If you think I'm screwed up, you come back in and tell me, bring it up right now. Tell me, I need to know that. And so I, that's why I think it's very important for commanders to be listening all the time. I, I say listening every day. And I don't mean to the, um, the uh, one hour PowerPoint briefing in your office. I mean, out to the various venues within your organization, you know, the dining facility, the motor pool, the workspace where they, where they live, the training area, and turn off the transmit mode and just sit there and listen. And um, uh, I found that it makes a, a big difference. Uh, <clears throat> and you don't have to just be face-to-face -face listening. When I was comrade at Kessler West Point, um, I used to talk to the all four classes once a year, just give them the, the marching orders and get a chance to get feedback. And at the end of each briefing, and I talked to the first class and second class twice a year, at the end of each uh, session, I said, if you have an issue or a problem or an idea or recommendation, send me an email. So I was on email with 4,400 cadets. Anytime they want to send me an email. And I was listening and I said, you'll always get an answer. Now, most of the time it was a very short answer like, no. <laughs> like the first class, group of first class cadets said, hey, sir, we're gonna get this thing. We're gonna go down to Washington Monument and, and lower and climb up the top and lower a beat Navy panel. No. <laughs> like I saved myself a lot of problems for that. So, so go ahead. In regard to saying no to leadership, my, my background's Army JAG and uh, Army civilian lawyer. I was told by a senior leader at the Pentagon, he said, sometimes you want to hear no, because that protects me. So they want to hear no sometimes. They don't want the yes. Uh, I'm sorry. I would, I'm not sure I understood. You want to hear what? No. He yeah. said, sometimes we want to hear no. Yeah. Because there's so, so many times we're told uh, if a leadership wants something, make it happen. But he said, sometimes we want the no answer because it protects us. Yeah, right. Okay. You, this is number three for you. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering what happened to General Desasor. So I just looked up, you know, go to the encyclopedia, go to Wikipedia. He was given a Distinguished Service Medal for his period of time in Vietnam of 1966 and 67. Yet he had been relieved of command. I, I know. <laughs> Don't answer it. Not on my watch. Go ahead. And, and that's a good point, but just to clarify, he was moved 
to a position where he actually knew what he was talking about. He was the commander of I Field Force Artillery. So it was also moved out of the sector because I think he left his stink. So he went up to the middle part of the country, but he actually did a good job because that was what he knew. And I did, you know, not to belabor the point, but I think to some extent, whoever chose the SSR to take over that regiment bears some responsibility too, because you, you know, you got to choose the right person for the right job. Right. And then this is, that was from my original, because I'm, I'm having this long discussion with someone who's arguing who chose them. Was it land? Was it seaman? Was right. it Westmoreland? Any rate. So sometimes they, they can be a very good officer, but just make sure they're doing the right thing in the right spot. If the individual's got the right qualifications, that's very important. Not only that, they have the right qualifications, they can start to make progress from day one because they know what they're talking about and they can get in there and do all the things they need to get done. Let me just ask you this. Can you disobey orders? Just flat disobey orders. Is there any, any reason why we can do that? And I know you're going to say it depends. <laughs> Go ahead in the back. No, wait, over here. I'm going to, I get somebody over here first. Yeah, I'm a Navy, former Navy JAG, and yes, you can disobey orders if they're illegal. It's that simple, or actually not that simple. Did you say you can't if they're you illegal? If they're illegal. Right. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I had that happen. I had a battalion, when I was a company commander, I had a battalion commander give me an efficiency report uh, to sign, and uh, I told him, no, I would not do it. That the, He says, I'm ordering you to sign this. And I said, I would not do it because it's illegal. Um, it's not what I agree that what I thought of the, uh, what I thought of the, uh, no, I know what it was. I wrote it. He wrote his, he told me to change mine. The map. I told him that was an illegal order uh, to sign it. And I disobeyed him on it. Um, and brigade commander happened to love me. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. I managed to stay in the army for a little while longer, but you really, really uh, are hanging out there when you do that. But there yeah. are time, there is that time to do it. Yeah, and and this is great discussion. The reason why I want to bring that up was because I just feel there are times when you have to say no. It's it's not the right thing to do. It's in your judgment, and you just you just got to go say no. Which gets back to the question before: if you've been in uh, school and had instilled in you those deep moral ethical uh, principles, and you've been used to values-based decision-making, it becomes much easier for you. And especially uh, as, as you gain more experience in that, because those moral ethical dilemmas don't get any easier, the higher the rank, the more responsibility, they get more complex and more difficult. Let me just ask you this. Um, uh, I got a, a, a quote here, let's paraphrase, I guess, um, of a very high ranking um, senior officer who said that um, you can disobey orders. Now, uh, I'm going to read it to you. It said, subordinates need to understand they have the freedom and are empowered to disobey a specific order to accomplish a larger purpose. This means disciplined disobedience. And if that means teaching soldiers to disobey smartly, do it. What do you think said that? Call out. No, but you're close. <laughs> General Mark Milley, when he was Chief of Staff of the Army, and, um, and, and, and he was specifically now talking about if there's a higher purpose, there's some other issue in there, you, you need to do it. You need to say, no, I want to do it. Uh, that's, I, I, that's an excerpt from an article that was in the Summer 27, 2017, 2015 uh, Division Association magazine. But uh, those were his words, and uh, there's a lot of other uh, other qualifying factors which he had in there you know he said you can't do it willy-nilly you got to really think about it and everything but there's come times when you've got to disobey orders because there's a larger purpose involved and whether that larger purpose is simply the risk to your soldiers that's his, that's a pretty high purpose right there and that's what you need to do I, I'm running out of time but I wanted to clear up one thing how could the um, and this is kind of a simple tactical issue, but how could 
the issue with Charlie Company getting the wrong information going behind uh, enemy lines, how could that have been prevented? Because that was a, you know, not only did they get up there surrounded by VC and NBA, but then, you know, we had to go get them, and so both companies had to uh, suffer as a result of it. How could that have been prevented? Remember what happened was um, a Barrett's in, a, in an aircraft, and, uh, the, you know, the blades are turning, noises, the whining of the engine, uh, and Malloy's on the ground with explosions going all around him. He gives him this information. <coughs> Maybe Barrett didn't get it quite right, but how could that have been avoided? Go ahead. I think that telling him to go east and north, he should have been told. Better situation and now awareness of why that direction was given. And it, it because, you know, in that company commander's mind, he has to be at a location. How he gets there is his call. Unless he understands, no, you really need to go this way and this is why. So I think there's a situation awareness issue here as well. Yeah. Anybody else? What's the one thing you got to have when you're in dense undergrowth and when you're at nighttime operations and that kind of thing? I mean, uh, it, it should have occurred to um, Malloy to take uh, a squad out of Alpha 127 that had landed at that landing zone and sent them to it and said, I'm going to have a squad to guide you into uh, the, the area behind us. It's guides. We don't think about guides enough, but just get folks down there, wait on the LZ until that squad gets to you. And that squad leader will say, follow me. And he would guide you right in there. And that would have prevented that. Anyway, I'm out of time. Thank you very much for listening. God bless. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.